All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are recording. I'm glad to have everybody that's here. We've got a nice little group of people that's uh, showed up into the chat room area. And uh, it is December 23rd, the eve before the eve of Christmas. And a lot of us have gone through the last couple weeks of, of going through everything with Yule. And we're still going through a lot of stuff. We went through three different rituals, three nights in a row. And so I've been busy and, you know, getting ready for this and stuff. So it's been a very interesting last couple of weeks. I live in the Midwest. Oh, and if you hear two things, A, there may be a possibility of a very loud train going by. I live about 50 yards from a, a railroad track. And yeah, so that's going to be fun. And I hope no, none of them come by while we're doing this. And uh, yeah, this will be recorded for posterity. And after we get through, I uh, will go through the process of editing and doing all the little things that I need to do. And this will go up on my YouTube channel, A Pagan Perspective, and we'll get to talk a little bit more about that. But tonight, I am so glad I've done, this is like my third or fourth Zoom interview that I've done over the last couple of years. And tonight, I am very glad to have with us Prudence Priest, Priestess of the Northern Way. She has been in this for so many years with uh things such as amaranth energies uh uh the ava ring of troth uh, covenant of the goddess world traveler uh working with a lot of things in lithuania and so on and so forth and it's like she is a true elder she's been somebody that i have been hearing about uh even before i started my own journey journey into the, the realm of heathen things Way back in the 90s, there was a video in 1993 that was given to me. It's called Between the, Between the Worlds, put together by Greg Harder. And also, I have been following not just Prudence, but uh, other priestesses in the field, such as uh, somebody that I highly recommend her books, and that's Diana Paxson. And so it's like, it is very cool whenever we get a chance to come together and uh, talk to these people that have been such a part of the movement. Thank you for doing this, Prudence. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. And if I may, I'd recommend one more author, and her name is Erin Lale, and she has an, a book out called Us the True for Beginners. So if you're interested in heathenism, it's on a uh, Kindle, Amazon, you know, all kinds of places, but it's a, a paperback book. So it's a real book. So yeah. And a matter of fact, Erin, after, after I kind of got things going together with you to get this set up, she contacted me and <laughs> yeah, cause she saw some of the things that, in places that you had posted and stuff like that. And then she messaged me and possibly uh, further down the line, I might in, end up doing an interview with her. I've got some other irons in the fire and things going on, but yeah, she contacted me and we talked for just a little bit. Um, one of the things it's like, I, I have like a little bit of a method to my madness whenever I do interviews. And one of the things that I think that is very important for pagans and spiritual people to know is, you know, that whenever they they see someone that is working so hard in the community and has worked so hard in the community over so many years you kind of want to see where where they came from into the past and what has brought them to the place that they are now so what i want to do with you tonight prudence is start kind of at the beginning uh you know like as far as with uh, your younger years your childhood and and things how were how were you uh, what was your spiritual life? How did that work all through your teenage years and into the adult years? And kind of culminate that with what brought you into uh, the world of paganism, witchcraft, heathen work, and all that, if you would. Okay, well, uh, you said we only had 90 minutes, but uh, <laughs> I, I'll uh, try and make it short. And if uh, you have more questions, you can ask me. I'll Certainly. I'll pause, you know, at 18 and, you know, go on. But anyway, um, I 
I was born at dawn on the summer solstice. My birthday is June 21st. And several thousand years ago, I would have been turned over to a temple to be raised by the priest and priestesses there since I was born on solstice. And I never forgave my mother for not doing that. And I probably did my uh, first ritual was I married my little sister when she was six years old to her boyfriend at the time. It was real puppy love, but that was my first priestess act. But that's when I was 12. But when I was, I was baptized Presbyterian. And when I was like six or seven, they had a deck of those, um, you know, witch playing cards. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of that deck, but I'd never seen a deck that looked like that. And again, when I was probably between six and 12, my father just loved to have me play parlor tricks because, um, for one thing, if uh, we were playing cards, I knew what was in everybody's hand. And I thought everybody did. Of course, I was disabused of that notion. But he would hold up numbers, you know, like when they were having bridge parties, mm -hmm. he would hold up fingers behind his back and say, oh, how many fingers am I holding up? And I never missed until I got tired <laughs> of playing the game. And um, then when... I was 12, there's other, some other things in between, but um, when I was 12, I went to, my mom went to the Episcopalian church mm -hmm. and my father was an unrepentant heathen. That's what his mother called him. So anyway, <laughs> uh, he would go to church and stand outside and smoke cigars and drink and, you know, talk to the other guys and come in and pass the bucket for the money. And um, I was in the choir then, and we were telling jokes while we were waiting for the organist to show up. And Reverend Hansen came over to me and he shook me for laughing. You know, he's like, you're not supposed to laugh in church. Oh and that's when gosh. I decided that, you know, if the Christian God doesn't have a sense of humor, I'm, I'm just not interested. Mm -hmm. So... And uh, my parents didn't make me go to church, which was good. And like I said, my, my dad could have cared less, but, you know, he was happy to, you know, go and hang out with his buddies outside. So, and another thing that uh, at that church, though, uh, probably before that happened, they had like a cakewalk and, you know, some kind of fundraising fair. And the cakewalk had like, 20 numbers on it or something and they played the piano and when they stopped I was on the winning number and I did that seven times in a row Ooh. and they would not let me play anymore so <laughs> like I said I had uh, aptitudes for the craft and for uh, that and also um, I think when I was nine at the local library, they had like a five shelf bookcase and it was about, you know, three or four feet wide. And it was all uh, folklore and fairy tales and all that. And I got an award because I read every book on that bookshelf. Whoa, and, that's and good. Quite a young age. But um, the other thing that happened when I was 13, there was a coven in Cincinnati that, um, and I, I knew the son of the high priest of that. I, I don't think I should mention names, but anyway, it, it really was like Rosemary's baby. You know, it was a bunch mm -hmm. of old folk. Well, not to, to, you know, when you're 13, there are a bunch of Yeah, old everybody's old but when you're young. Everybody's old, but basically, you know, it was like they were my parents' age or, you know, around there. And um, they, because I had such psychic abilities, they wanted me to um, join their coven. However, it was kind of like, you know, becoming a nun. I was kind of like, well, if I join this, you know, how do I get out of this if I decide I don't like it? So I, I never joined it. But as far as I know, mm -hmm. their son, who's a year older than I am, is still running uh, that coven in Cincinnati. And um, then let's see, I was in high school. And when I was 16, I went to Walnut Hills in Cincinnati, and that was a very highly academic school. Mm -hmm. And 
for, they had a guy there named Baron Wilson. And as an elected activity after school was over, instead of going, you know, getting detention or going to study hall, you could take Greek or Swahili. And he was amazing, <laughs> he was like eight different languages. So my best friend at the time, Analo and Hauk and I were taking Greek. And he had us read that Edith Hamilton book. And the first sentence in that says, no one worships the Greek gods anymore. And we looked at each other and we said, why not? So, <laughs> you know, and they had us, uh, you know, he had us reading Greek and we were finding uh, uh, the hymns to the various deities mm -hmm. or the Olympian gods. And so we were really into that. But after I graduated from high school, oh, and, and our coven was called, my first coven was called Idioplastos, which is Greek for the power of thought. Oh, and, um, wow, I like that. Yeah, we did too. Like I said, I started out really young. Anyway, <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, after I graduated high school, uh, we moved to Dayton and I was accepted. Uh, she and I both, we were the first two women uh, accepted at uh, Yale University the first year they took women. But I wouldn't go and she's the one because they, when I went to visit, they go, oh, and we have an 8.30 curfew for women. And I'd never had a curfew in my life. And oh, like, wow. Ridiculous. And then Anna's the one that wrote the book about, um, you know, how terrible they treated women the first year mm -hmm. they were there. Mm -hmm. And I was really glad I didn't go. But I, I went to, well, we used to call it a White Straight University. And Abby Hoffman spoke there once. And uh, Jerry Rubin went to my high school. Oh, wow. So, um, and I, I was uh, originally cutting back, going back to Cincinnati when I lived there. Like, uh, well, I went to the convention in Chicago in 68. And that's when I joined Witch uh, through the East Village Other. They used to sell it in you know, a head shop up in mm -hmm. Cincinnati. And Witch stood for the Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell. And we're the ones <laughs> that went to Washington, D.C. and tried to exorcise the Pentagon and surround it. But the police, nobody there would let us make a circle around the Pentagon. So who knows what would have happened if uh -huh. we had been able to do that. And my only uh, uh, odd experience there was uh, we were tear gassed so many times that I am oh, immune no. to tear gas at this point and, oh, wow. uh, and I went to a demonstration and uh, again when I moved to Dayton I joined the staff of the underground newspaper there and we went to one of the you know end the war demonstrations in mm -hmm. DC and all my friends are dropping like flies and I'm like what's going on and they go well they're tear gassing us I go really you know because nothing was <laughs> And, um, it wasn't going to mess with you because you you didn't you just been through it so much that it was nothing. Oh yeah, Chicago was oh man yeah we just got gassed all the time it was crazy. And one night when I came back to the church because I was only sixteen when mm -hmm. I went and uh, I I got back to the church and they wouldn't even let me in. They brought out oh, a no. blanket and said take your clothes off because I smelled so badly from all the tear gas. Everybody was, you know, couldn't stand yeah. to be moved. So, and then they, you know, sent me to the showers. But uh, like I said, I haven't been allergic or, you know, haven't had any reaction mm -hmm. to tear gas ever since. So that was good. But uh, to get back to the craft in Dayton, we opened up a little, um, like, uh, well, we had, I, they used to call them head shops and we sold water beds and Zodiac postcards and, uh, we had tea and cookies in the front room every day. And we'd you know, have discussions about occult matters. And the store was called the Amaranth. And we formed a coven uh, basically out of our shop uh, in 1971. And this year we just celebrated our 50th anniversary. Oh, wow. So yeah, I, I, when you say I have a lot of experience, I do. That's what I mean, it's gonna take a long while to get there, but that brings me up to, uh, you know, when we started Amaranth Energies and most Greek groups, I only know uh, one other public uh, 
Greco Norse group, and that's Prodea in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And I met them at Pan Pagan 80, and we're still friends. <laughs> so <laughs> um, anyway, shout out to Prodea. Some of them may be listening. But uh, any que other questions so far? No, you're doing good. I'm, I'm just going to let you keep on. All right. Well, once we had the coven set up, um, you know, and, and we were, you know, taking in just about anybody that was interested, or at least uh, uh, technically at that time, we were Neo-Pythagoreans, and there are five degrees. And the first degree is called auscultantes, which means listener. And that's like the Greek word for auditor. Because mm -hmm. basically in Pythagorean times, you they didn't want to hear anything from the beginners, you know, or the first degrees because they didn't know anything. And mm -hmm. they had to learn from the other initiates and from Pythagoras himself. And that could take up to seven years before you were considered, you know, before you got your second degree. Mm -hmm. So then also you know we mostly went to the year and a day you know by then we'd read yeah. civil league and we'd sent money to sit circle sanctuary to start up and we were getting the witch's almanac that's still being published yes by, uh, yes and i i love that it used to be like a ray buckland's candle burning book you know it was basically like a that size yeah yeah like a little bitty you know, yeah you know, half a sheet of eight and a half by 11 with, I don't know, not very many pages, but enough. And, um, and it had all the same features, only now the Witch's Almanac has a lot more. Yeah, it's um, a lot more it's a, a modern and, and stuff, yeah. Right, right. And um, let's see, I'm trying to think what else about during that time. Well, in the early 80s, well, we used to do classes at the shop and, um, I started, uh, well, I guess that was all 72. We started the Raspberry Radical, which was an underground newspaper. And the very first uh, article, and uh, this was when, you know, uh, Watergate was happening and Spiro Agnew was being whatever. Oh, yeah. And either our first or second issue had a spell on Richard Nixon. And it, it was, uh, and it worked. <laughs> That's what I can say. <laughs> I'll tell you what it had. It had a picture of Richard Nixon with his long Pinocchio nose, you know. Uh, like, that, yeah, that cart to political yeah, cartoons have been everywhere. Yeah. I remember seeing something like that. But underneath it, it said, what you should do is cut this out of the newspaper, uh, cut this picture out, and dig a hole in the ground. And bury this picture, uh, or not, don't bury it, put the picture in the hole in the ground, and then you were supposed to urinate on it. Ah, uh, that's what I thought. I was thinking you were going to go that way. Water, but fire next time. And, you know, then it was Watergate, and he was out of there. So oh, yeah. It was. <laughs> so, uh, and that was fun. You know, I don't know how many people did it, but that was like the first, first, uh, public thing, I guess we did. And in 78 in Dayton, Ohio, um, some people came out from the Dayton Daily News because we were doing a public uh, summer solstice. And my dad, uh, who was also in the coven, um, he would like sit in the chair in the robe in our uh, great hall. We had a, a large um, living room. We called it a great hall and it had a fireplace and mm -hmm. um, He'd sit in his chair with his cigar, and as people came into the room, he'd go to him, "Are you a pagan?" And you know, he was like our black man. And the two reporters didn't know what to do, you know. But they were like, "Yes, yes," and you know. But my dad was kind of gruff, and he he was a big man. He was like six four and oh, at boy. least two hundred and fifty pounds. So it was very intimidating. And um, anyway, a few years later. They showed up at Starwood. This one girl showed up in Star, the early Starwoods. They started in 84 and they were near uh, Cleveland, but, you know, probably like halfway between Cleveland and Dayton. And at we the, would- Hold up just a second. Wasn't that around the time that Ace had started? 
that first that ace, the, the, the society. Oh, that yeah. Oh, yeah. I know Star all with. Okay. They know me. Uh, yeah, Association for Consciousness Enlightenment or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, Larry Cornett is a member of ACE, and he's a member of our coven. And he started awesome. like the first pagan BBS, which is really yeah, going he did. back. Yes. And, uh, so, you know, he's, he's still in our coven. I just sent him for our anniversary. I had little name badges made. Oh, that's coven. nice. And I'd be wearing mine, but you probably couldn't see it on this anyway. <laughs> but uh, so I'm trying to think what year I'm up to. Okay, so we showed up at Starwood and this lady, we had a, my dad had a 1970 brown limousine and all of us fit in it. And we were flying a, a flag <laughs> and we had an Amaranth Energies banner. And we put a sign on the back, like just married, only it said Starwood or bust. And that was the year Robert Anton Wilson was there too. And uh, oh, me and wow. my dad were uh, like roommates at one of the cabins. Cause again, they were, uh, they were already elders or, you know, seniors or whatever. So mm -hmm. they stayed in, they had a few cabins you could rent, but mostly it was a, a camp out. And uh, anyway, this, blonde, willowy blonde in a black velvet cape. And it was held at the Devil's Den State Park at a clothing optional place. Okay, okay. she had nothing on under the cape. So she comes up to my dad and she goes, Louie, I remember you. And so she starts telling him the story about how she was one of the reporters that had showed up in 78, you know, five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, and he, she, she said, it's because of you that I became a witch. And she gave Louie a big hug. And uh, Louie was just stunned. And uh, I said, gee, that makes you an elder. So from uh, car, we have older credentials since, you know, he brought somebody into the craft. But uh, I'll try to backtrack a little in... 1980, we went to Pan Pagan 80, which was uh, in Gary, Indiana, which okay. is very close to Chicago. And um, at that point, they'd gotten up to like 400 attendees, which was a huge number. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people from there, like I said, after Pan Pagan 80, Starwood started up, the Canadians uh, started up because they'd come down. They, they did the most amazing thing. I, I, I really love the Canadians. They did uh, their own ritual, and it was they did foaming pentacles of beer in all the corners. <laughs> they, they were just hilarious, and uh, you know we really got along with them. So they started doing Wiccan Fest, which is still going in Canada, mm -hmm. and that's probably yeah, I've heard of that. Besides Kaleidoscope, which is probably just as big or bigger, or Raven's Knoll. Uh, but Wiccan Fest was the first, and they're still going on, although COVID's kind of cramped yeah. our stock last couple of years. And um, trying to think, you know, from Pan Pagan 80 on, we were going everywhere. And the other thing that was interesting at Pan Pagan, when we all showed up for the opening ritual, they made everybody, you know, become a rainbow. You know, whatever color, if you were wearing purple, all the purple people stood next to each other. If you're wearing red, all the red mm -hmm. and the orange and the yellow. And then that became your uh, tribe or clan for the weekend. And the two other, well, there were like five or six people in, but Owen Rowley, who was in uh, Tuaha de Danan, which is uh, uh, one of the um, New England covens. Uh, and, uh, and Ian's a member of that too. But anyway, uh, they showed up and they had to, well, besides uh, Owen, who was with that coven and later joined mine, there was uh, uh, Raymond Buckland, who was in purple, and uh, Gwydion, who did the fairy shaman. Oh, and Gwydion, yeah. Probably some others, but I had a really good time uh, being in the, the purple clan, and I still love purple. But... Uh, and uh, again, a difference between uh, some covens or, you know, the traditional or classical ones, most of the um, um, modern ones, or for example, the Gardnerians, their colors are 
you know, red and black and white. Mm -hmm. But in the older, you know, more nature traditions, the colors are the colors of nature. Mm -hmm. And the colors in our group are uh, purple, green, and gold. Wow, and I like that. Things because those are the colors of nature. So uh, let's see, what else should we do? So that was the big, that's where I met Allison. That's where they did witch side story. Uh, her coven <laughs> came and um, I'm trying to remember her name, but anyway, she rewrote West Side Story and it was uh, uh, called Witch Side Story. And I'm still singing songs from that at different groups, but originally I was just one of the eclectets or one of the chorus people. Yeah. But uh, after that, uh, we moved to California and that was the mass exodus to California. And that's where I met like Russell and Valerie and they were from Atlanta. You know, people came from all over the place mm -hmm. and Allison and her crew had come from California and Z Budapest had shown up and she split their council apart because she was having, uh, you know, a, a, a young girls ritual and they were all examining their vaginas and their parents went nuts <laughs> you know, uh, like yeah doing that or you know whatever and there was no contact with anybody else and I didn't go but of course we heard all about it because again I wasn't a young girl but it was just for mm -hmm. you know young girls because I, I will give an example from my personal history when I first started menstruating I was like Carrie my mother had told me nothing I thought I was dying. Oh, bed. yeah, I remember Carrie the movie, yeah. There's a lot of women from my era that, you know, didn't have a clue. So, and a lot of us didn't care, you know, that, that we were happy somebody was explaining the facts of life to young girls, <laughs> right? And um, so that was interesting. But after that, in 81, I swore I was never going to spend another winter in Ohio because we had like really bad blizzard and mm -hmm. snow mm -hmm. that the year before. And we left in January and drove straight south and went uh, almost to New, or New Orleans to drive all the way out. And it took us three, took us almost three months to get to California, but we had a great time. We stopped everywhere. Mm -hmm. like Smoky Bear, Petrified Forest. We stopped at my consort's uh, aunt in Bogue Cheeto, Mississippi. You know, <laughs> and, uh, and then his sister lived in Nacogdoches, Texas. And this was uh, early in January. And we stayed with her and um, till she had her baby. And then we left and we went camping in the Wichita Mountains, which are the oldest mountains in the United States. And it was end of January and there mm -hmm. was hard there was nobody there when we came in and we came in on a Monday and there are pink granite mountains and that's where the buffalo room and I did a full moon ritual down at Panther Lake and a panther oh wow along with all the unbelievable amounts of garbage in that lake which you know oh. we tried to, but uh, it was a truly magical place to be and on Friday there's an air force base nearby and some, you know, young soldier came into camp and we're like, oh, well, might as well leave. <laughs> oh, there's humans here. So we kept going, but we hit everything. The Grand Canyon. Um, I don't know. We went to Disneyland because we took the Southern route because, you know, it was winter. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a great experience. And then when I got to California, uh, now I'm up to about where I got into Covenant of the Goddess and then later into uh, Ossetru. But are there any questions again before I go into that? I need a sip of water. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna get some too. I, you know, and and uh, you know, just kind of relating kind of some of the things that you've talked about. Uh, as far as for myself, it's like you talk about Ray Buckland. Um, my tradition, I run. Oh, and I also forgot to tell for people also that uh, uh, Prudence is also, and I don't know if she's still active or or, or whatever that uh, a member of the OTO. I've run in three circles. I call myself multicultural, as in Golden Dawn. I'm also a Druid. I have a group here in Springfield called the Order of Standing Oak. 
And within the last two years, I've recently uh, started a group here called Raven Temple of CX Wicca. Um, it was a pleasure. I uh, Several years before Ray Buckland died, I was able to interview him. And I've come from other traditions of witchcraft and stuff. So it's like, and, you know, for me, I started in 91, 92, 93, back at that time. And uh, one thing that I thought was so cool is not only you know, had I seen the, the, the video, but I also kind of heard rumblings about things that were going on in the East Coast for Starwood. And then there were things that were starting to gel in California, Northern California, yeah. there was a lot going on. Southern California, there was a lot going on. Diana Paxson, Glenn Turner, uh, uh, Starhawk, everybody was getting their engines going, like the deal with Starhawk and... Um, uh oh gosh Sorry, Star Murphy. well starhawk uh, and starhawk's books starhawk's book um was published the same year that drawing down the moon came out As matter of fact they both <laughs> yeah they both came out on Samhain. they their published yeah. date was on Samhain. so it's like and you know you started to hear more because at that time here, as far as like in the area that I was at, there were very few as a true groups. There was very few anything, whatever. We had one here was the, uh, it's called GOAT, Greater Ozarks as a True Thinkstead. He was ran, it was ran by a man who unfortunately went through several motorcycle wrecks. His name was Slowfoot. And he's done the festival circuit and things like that. And he was trying, you know, to kind of like educate people around here because at that time there were still, we, here uh, where I'm at, we have the brass buckle of the Bible Belt. And back then, because it's that new thing, the Internet's just starting to come out. The festival movement's kind of starting to come out in various regions and stuff. And when you're living in that concentrated of a Christian kind of thing, it's like they were very not fond of us. Uh, we had people's cars broken into. Uh, people were divorced because of being, you know, pagan and all this other Those stuff. People were losing custody of their children. Yeah, that kind of thing too. And it's just like, that's why whenever I was seeing, you know, what was going on with you, things that were going on with Troth, things that were, you know, going on with other groups around the country and stuff. It's like, I just had a feeling that over the years, these things were going to become more important. Covenant of the Goddess was going to be more important. Troth was going to be more important and stuff because, the time that we are in now, especially as long as yourself and me and others have been in this, we've seen the growing pains of so much of it. And that's why I ask the questions the way I do when I interview people, because it's like you're going from not necessarily a point of weakness, but you're going up from a point of newness and you're, you know, coming out of whatever spiritual path that you were in before and then moving into the crap, moving in to as a true and other he's and practices, it becomes a strength. And for people like you and Diana Paxson and these other people, it's like, this is the time to get in and find out how you came into this and what are the things that as a priestess have made you strong. And I think that is one of the things like, however you did come into this is going to be so important for people to hear because some people are afraid to get involved with that is true because they hear a lot or even any he's a practice because they hear a lot of the negative stuff that's especially oh, some of the things that's a lot of, there's a lot of negative stuff i was in the book holy blood holy grail which is all about you know racist nazi uh Ossetur groups but mm -hmm. i'm in there as the only group you know with the truth and the uh, uh Freya's folk and the uh american vinland association uh, the only reason I, in that book is I'm like the only group that was not racist, but because that's very I was cool. in a that's racist very cool. book, I was getting all these, you know, weird, weird comments or weird letters or, you know, you must be in this. But all of our literature, you know, from the troth on, uh, we were always members of Heathens Against Hate. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, our group Freya's folk, which was a, a member kindred and eventually became a Hoff within the Ring of Truth. Um, we, we have, and we still have one of the most diverse groups in, in Northern California. 
and probably in all of the Aussie true groups. And, you know, for people that to, to kind of know what, what she's talking about, it's like you have, you do have phrase folk, you have the AVA, you have the truth. And it's cool that they've taken a stand because then you go to the other side with the, with the AFA, Stephen Flowers. Oh, oh and, yeah. No, all uh, of that. They just printed an article. I, I can hold this up. I, I have it laying on the table because I was showing it to my uh, group at uh, Yule on Tuesday. Anyway, this is unbelievable. Uh, one of these guys, uh, one of my friends who used to write for our magazine that we published for 25 years called Ibrazil. I'm going to see if this shows up. Let's see if I can make that. The, oh, yeah, that's showing pretty good. See, this is a temple building, and that's like Steve McNallan in the picture yep. without his fourth or fifth wife. But anyway, um, it's the called The Racist Next Door, inside a California church that preaches a whites-only gospel. And this was in the Sacramento Bee in November. And again, he's now changed the name to the Ossetru Folk Foundation. Or instead, but it's still, you know, AFF or AFA, and, you know, he's, and he's finally admitted that he is racist. And I didn't even think you could uh, uh, have a, uh, yeah, the caption on the uh, uh, picture says, take a tour of controversial church, see inside the Thor worshiping whites only Ossetru folk assembly in Yuba County. And I didn't even think they allowed people to do that, but you know. And and you know, it's <laughs> like know, I got this, that boggled my mind when I saw that. Yeah, and it's like what people don't realize is that's been going on since. I mean, the the original hey. AFA started in like seventy five as well as far back as what I've yes, heard. Yes. Well, uh, okay. Well, you're in Seax Wicca now. I can go back to that era, and that kind of ties into. Uh, before I even moved to California, there's a group in New York, or no, in a part of New York that hangs over Pennsylvania, you know, uh, Western New York. I'm trying to remember the name of the town, but there was a man there named Garmin Lord, and he and Gert McQueen published a magazine, and um, Garmin and... Um, Steve Mc, uh, he Garmin published a picture of Steve McNallan and Edward Thorson, who yeah. had just you know, joined. And this was, oh, uh, you know, eighty or before, you know, the seventies. And mm -hmm. uh, and I used to get their magazine again, published in an underground paper. You got a lot of what you know, Circle mm -hmm. and other publications at the time. So, and I would subscribe to anything back then because, mm -hmm. again, I lived in Dayton, Ohio, which is <laughs> not quite as bad as uh, the Bible Belt, but we've changed that name. We're trying to turn it into the girdle of the goddess. There and you go. I like uh, that. We're uh, working on it hard, and it's nowhere near as bad as it was, you know, last century. Mm -hmm. But um, Edred, and Edred used to get uh, accused of being a racist because he'd been initiated uh, with, uh, uh, into some group with Steve McNallan. And he used to get just all kinds of things because he went to Rulesburg in uh, Germany to uh, study the runes in the basements of these you know, places, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Hitler's henchmen were. And then they're all going, they were going, you know, he's a racist, he's a, a, a Nazi, he's this and that. And his wife is Jewish. Okay, and I've met her. Her name's Crystal, and and uh, you know he's he's not racist at all, and and he is the founder of the Ring of Troth. And um, when I heard about the Ring of Troth, uh, I joined uh, the Rune Guild, and I studied. You know, at that time, he had the book Futhark out, just the first one of the trilogy, mm -hmm. and in the back, it had you know. Oh, if you want to learn more about the runes, sign up and, you know, take lessons and uh, take tests. And, you know, it, it was kind of like a degree system to be an elder in the truth. And I was already in the rune guild and I am actually 
a pre Caveldolfian elder because when I took over as steers woman in uh, 93, I think, um, as a first, and we used to call ourselves in Norse mythology, uh, it's Odin and his brothers, and they call him, call them Har or High, just as High and Third, which of course is uh, gender neutral. But uh, so Edward was uh, High and uh, James Chisholm, who wrote, you know, a book on heathen worship, kind of like uh, uh, Aaron Lales, because we have a, a different altar set up from, you know, say a Wiccan coven, but it's, uh, uh, it's called, you know, when you set up a, a heathen altar, it's called a vie, which looks kind of like the peace sign, mm -hmm. and the altar goes in the middle. But the really interesting thing, when I set one up at Boaten Vault, the angle is 72 degrees. And that's like the top point or the bottom point or any point in a pinnacle because mm -hmm. the angles are 72 degrees and that makes 360 degrees. Being the Pythagorean, I, you know, pay attention. <laughs> to but uh, we did, uh, yeah, and that was the other thing. When I was in uh, living in San Francisco, we moved out here in 81. And that's when I joined COG and I didn't think I'd get in because I didn't think anybody knew me, but I'd met Allison at Pan Pagan. And mm -hmm. in those days, if Allison said you were cool, you were in, <laughs> you know? So uh, our coven got in on um, the uh, COG and I became one year, well, I was a local officer and they used to publish, well, they still do about, it's probably on email now. They did a uh, newsletter you know, like most groups for the eight mm -hmm. Sabbaths. And uh, I took over running it one year because um, they didn't have anybody else to do it. And Allison says, well, if you're going to be on the board of directors, you have to be an elder because, you know, the newsletter editor had, was on the board of directors. And I said, mm -hmm. okay. And Allison said, well, I'm going to make you an elder. And that was it. <laughs> and, um, so another person later on that I applied for elder credentials for, and there was a lot of controversy over this. I managed apartment buildings in San Francisco from, you know, like 80 something to uh, 88, at least at this one building. And I was out uh, going to all the apartments because, you know, they're old buildings and they would do monthly roach spraying or bug pest control. And I went up on the top floor and I go in with the guy and I usually stood outside, but I went in this guy's apartment and he had nine statues of the Norse gods. Oh, wow. Shelves, and he had all these unbelievable mystery awards, science fiction awards, uh, nebulas, uh, a gray Mauser, you know, I mean, he had all kinds of things. And it was Fritz Leiber Jr., oh, yeah. the famous science that was in the the great building. Master, course, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, I wrote, uh, you know, we were best friends after that. And at his Christmas parties, he would talk about old school. He had an apartment on the sixth floor and his girlfriend had an apartment on the first floor. And they would come in and uh, they had uh, Christmas parties and, you know, the cast from Star Trek would show up. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I went to private screening of one of Stephen King's movies and Stephen King was there because Fritz was in his 70s when he joined the coven. And he told me that when he wrote Conjure Wife back before World War II, he says, I've been looking for a real witch all my life. So oh, wow. He, he had two statues of Freya and they're Dale Eisenbachers and the rest of them are all in... Um, a museum in, I think, in Houston, Texas. Uh, his son gave them to the museum because they're, they're just beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, even the little statue of Loki has a knife up his sleeve. Oh, but the wow. one of, he had two Freyas, one as mistress of uh, love with pigtails and braids. And he gave me the one of Freya as mistress of magic. And she's wearing her falcon cloak and an mm -hmm. amber ne well, a necklace. And, and in bronze, it's not amber, but anyway, and, um, and you know, we, we were lifelong friends. I uh, was at his funeral, and Diana Paxson was at his funeral as well, because, mm -hmm. you know, they, uh, 
uh, I went to something where they were all speaking together and Anne Rice was there. So I was with the science fiction crowd and uh, the other crowd. And he wrote an article about our coven for Locust Magazine back in the late 80s, I think. And, uh, but I started just recently this year, I was getting letters or comments from people going, Fritz was never in your coven, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, uh, yes, he is. Because when he wrote his last book, The Night and Knave of Swords, uh, and you were talking about Greg Harder, we did a documentary on Fritz's life. And we're busy getting all these DVDs copied. And we'll mm -hmm. probably uh, you know, have them for sale at some point. But I'm hoping. I'm, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. We did get um, uh, Between the Worlds done. and. Uh, there's a man in Valdosta, Georgia. This year's just been unbelievable because you're about my third or fourth interview. And this year I was made an elder in Lithuania, which Very is pretty cool. good because I, I barely speak Lithuanian, but I've done a lot of rituals there. The picture on my Facebook page, mm -hmm. which is Grace, the, the big one, not the one you like to me in the high seat, uh, is... Uh, me at Menuo Yodoragas, which I always wanted to go to, and that means the moon and the heart, or the stag, H-A-R-T. Mm -hmm. And they've been doing it, I went to the 28th one in 2015, and Enia, who is the high priestess of Lithuania, she, uh, one of her daughters was ill, and she couldn't make it, and she contacted me, and that, that picture on, on my Facebook page is me leading the opening ritual for um, that festival. And I had 2,000 people in that circle. Oh, Nine wow. Drummers. I don't know how many drummers, you know, a dozen drummers, a dozen singers. And uh, uh, and it's on a, held on an island, which is perfect, called Sarase, that's between Lithuania and Latvia. And we just had the best time there. It, it was great. So yeah. that's why I like that. And that picture of me in a, uh, in a uh, high seat is somewhat different from, um, you know, say there is it's practiced here because in say there, you're like channeling the gods or you're being mm -hmm. possessed by the gods. And uh, when you're sitting on that seat, as you can see, there's a figure whispering in your ear. Mm -hmm. And that's very, you know, it's like, that's not interfering with your will or like being possessed by a loa in a, uh, Mm -hmm. voodoo because I, I know a, a, a drummer a, you know a ritual drummer and they all you know they don't want to be possessed but they guide the lowest to mm -hmm. um, the people that uh, you know do want to be possessed or are uh, you know taken over uh, willingly or even unwillingly but most of the drummers you know they're they don't want to be possessed um, so I'm trying to think the point I was making on this. Um, again, we had a lot of people in various groups. And uh, I brought up Diana because she does do the oracular say there. And again, they're, they're speaking through, through the gods. And I, I've been there many times. And in fact, we used to hold a festival called Ravenwood. And it was on top of Mount Tamil Pius in the Redwoods. And we would rent both campsites. And um, that's where she first um, showcased doing is that, that. that. This mount that you're talking about, is that some of the uh, uh, footage that was uh, on uh, Between the Worlds where you did the hand fasting and then the next shot, the next oh, yes, shots? Yes, were... that was that. Yeah, that hand fasting was done at Ravenwood. And that was the first Ravenwood. That was in 1990. And Rowan and Brandon were getting married. And we had... We had people from the OTO. We had people from uh, uh, three other covens, and uh, and we had three a good other group of people there. You could tell. And, just, uh, you know. Oh yeah, and when you brought up uh, the druids, like you, I was in Rusty's group in the OTO in San Jose, but unlike um, most people that joined the OTO, I was only a Minerva which is a zero degree in the OTO, mm -hmm. but I'm actually one of very few OTO priestesses. And um, 
I've been to Glenn Turner. She used to have a lodge in Berkeley and I just went to her 80th birthday party oh, this year. Oh, wow. And she came out with Allison's group. She was also in the uh, Witch Side Story cool. uh, in Champagne 80. And of course, the first COG meeting was at her home in Berkeley. <laughs> so Very you know, I was cool. hanging out with them. Um, and, uh, you mentioned the Druids. I was initiated by Joan Carruth, who predated Isaac Bonowitz as the head of the Druids out here in California. So mm -hmm. I have, it's like when you were asking me to send a list, it's like, wow, I, I, uh, I really need to sit down and write these all down. I'm glad you're getting this in the interview because well, I've been in so many things. Now, now talking about the, uh, the, 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 that you have uh, Between the Worlds kind of put together, I'm hoping to get a hold of that in DVD if you ever actually have it. But well, the, the thing- Figure oh. out how to duplicate these. You know, I, I don't, you know, most places want you to make a hundred copies, and I'm not sure I'll get a hundred copies. Then, uh, as you heard, you know, most people don't know this, but I was having trouble even getting my uh, PC connected to a hotspot. So, oh gosh, yeah. I mean, the, I just the, 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 the trials that you have to go through to do it. Yeah. So, if anybody out there wants to contact you and tell me how I can get these DVDs duplicated, we have some amazing uh, DVDs available on very esoteric subjects, including, like you said, my rune workshop. Um, I did that at Glenn's store, Ancient Ways, which is still in uh, Oakland, I guess. Well, well, between Oakland and Berkeley. And, uh, and, and that, that I've done that many places. Again, I have uh, uh, lots of stuff from doing the runes and, we, we've got at least four DVDs that we'd like to, you know, start selling on Amazon or, you know. I somewhere. would love to get them. Speaking of the runes, this is something I want to talk talk with you about tonight, because if I don't, if I don't broach it, then I probably never will. But Okay, go ahead. <laughs> there's actually two things. We're going to kind of back to back these. But the first thing, one of the most, I mean, because I've watched that, I have in the back room here, I have an original VHS of Between the Worlds. It has been beaten up. It still plays in spots. It kind of like peters out and then comes back. All of the ritual stuff with you is intact. There's some other stuff that's on there that's not so much intact. But one well, of the some things. Some of the stuff was, you know, uh, every time you made a copy of a VHS, it, got the old worse. Bit, it degraded. So the Forever Forest, Gwydian stuff is, you know, uh, I mean, we had trouble putting that together. And the last one, in case you didn't notice, when we have Charlie Murphy singing the burning times, mm -hmm. that's Starhawk dancing in front of him. Yeah, I saw that. Okay. And also I saw you in the video for white white folks for wild once too. Right. Enjoying yourself. I remember that. But the thing that I think about that whole video, the 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 thing that just kind of just the kismet that brought me to even, you know, contacting you to do this interview is the sunrise of you standing there in the forest doing the rune galder that yes. the here i'm in the midwest and so many people are kind of um a lot of people aren't so gung-ho to dive head first into things whenever they're you know whenever they want to learn about the runes and these different things it's like they're very timid they don't you know they don't know so it's like seeing that and seeing that the way that it was uh, for you as a priestess and, and, you know, just for letting people know, what do you think is one of the more important things that people need to look at whenever they start to work with the runes? And also as far as not just the, you know, that beginning to work with the runes, but also, you know, what are some of the things that you think are important for people to know about Rune Galder on its, on its okay. own merits? Yes, well, Again, when I did that video, uh, yeah, we were in the coastal redwoods at, at dawn and we'd rented a, I don't know, a huge place in the woods to hang out that weekend. And that was actually done in, uh, for uh, Groundhog's Day, because that's <laughs> our, uh, uh, and I, I still call it, instead of calling it Emolk or Candle Mass or something, because, you know, those are all really Christian things. But Groundhog's Day, and that's when we started the coven as well, back in the 70s. Groundhog's Day is literally divination with animals. 
And the Greeks were very good at that. And the Catholic Church or the Christian Church can't co-opt it. So, <laughs> and in a Lithuanian tra tradition, it's Perkunas Day. And it's also the day that uh, Frey married Gerd or Gerth, depending on how you pronounce that last D. So, but to get back to Galder, uh, again, I, I worked with Edred in the, in the Rune Guild and um, I learned how to do Galder. And I have an old cassette tape of Edred uh, singing all the Rune songs or all the Rune poems. Mm -hmm. And you haven't lived till you've heard the Runes done with the Texas drawl. <laughs> it was very entertaining. But uh, I, I get a lot of comments on that in there because they go, you, you can feel me singing the room. Yes, Just, yes. I mean, right through the videotape. And again, um, you know, and I barely took a breath, but I, I, I've done it many times and I do it at rituals because that's a Norse way of casting a circle. And it, you know, making circles to practice in, uh, even the board of directors in, uh, of the priests and priestesses in Lithuania, they call it a circle. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and that's how, or a wheel. I take that back. The literal trans, well, a wheel is a circle, but it's called the wheel of the elders. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, when you make a circle, a circle is also a symbol as a zero, it has no beginning, no end. It's neither odd nor even. And, uh, you know, uh, to get to that point, uh, when I made that uh, video around 1990, you know, I'd already been a, a witch and a member of the Rune Guild and a pagan priestess and, you know, everything else. So uh, I have background in sacred song and sacred singing. And, um, uh, I had that rune wand, which is triangular. It's I love it. It's beautiful. Oh, I, I know. Like I said, I have a lot of different tools. You won't find, you know, a lot of witches use wands, but nothing like that. <laughs> you know? And, and, and so just for, before you go on, another thing that I thought was so cool whenever you did that video, and I've never, never seen one like it or probably never will since, is your rune robe. Oh, thank you. I made that. That is beautiful. It, it, it was a Swedish like sauna robe and actually i just have it hanging in my closet now because the front is fine but on the back the the butt's worn out <laughs> <laughs> so, okay but i'm turning the front into an apron because oh, it's still very worn. cool and there was a reason you know like your veins they're blue and the blood's red within them mm -hmm. so when i wear that rune robe so I embroidered it all and I did it all. Yeah, virtually. you did a lot of work through that. Yeah, and all that. But it had um, that the reason it was done in blue is because that was the outside of the vein. And see, if you have it in red, then you're embodying it. And so you want, you don't want, the Havamal says, know how to carve them, know how to stain them, know how to cut them, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. but, that's why they're in blue, because if they're in red, you know, I'd be like my wand. That would be different. But yeah. blue is the, uh, well, at least in, you know, magic or veins, red and blue are opposite colors. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they're not on a color wheel or anything, but uh, they are with the runes. So if you want to maintain neutrality or use it as a teaching tool, that's why they were in blue. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And the, you know, another thing is like, uh, for me, another thing is like here recently, especially after you've had shows like the series on uh, uh, Discovery Vikings and stuff, you know, we've had a lot of more, uh, you know, more, it's out there. There's a lot more people that are seeing this. And one thing that I see on Facebook groups and other magical groups, places online and stuff, there seems to be a division but mostly it's not a hardcore kind of division but you have one side of as a true and and these other things that th that they say that the purpose of the true is to honor the gods and to you know go forth and do these things that you are going to do through your life to go and just you know to get to valhalla and these other situations that that, that that's it that's all you do we're here to basically drink beer toast the gods 
bloat and stumble seven days a week. That's good. <laughs> and then you have the other side. And this is what I was kind of looking at as like currently, and just for anybody else out there, I am working through uh, Diana Paxson's book on oracular theater. And I yeah. love it, by the way. I love all her works. She's a very good, very good writer. Um, but the thing for me as, you know, also the, like that little <laughs> PDF that I posted to you the other night, there's been this kind of thing in the past. And you kind of have to look at it the way that it was then that, you know, for men to take up magic within a, a, any kind of heathen tradition, <laughs> it was kind of looked down upon because the women were the ones that sat the high seat. And did these did these other things, but I'm one of those people that believe with the way the world is today, and you know how we've got COVID and all these wars and just so many important things. I think everybody should honor the gods and still do magic, still uh, Rungaldar, the the satyr, everything because it's up to us. If we don't do it, who's going to? There's you know there's only so many priestesses like yourself, and Diana Pax, and so many people out there to do it that every little bit helps what do you think of the ideas of people that are finally starting to come around how do we let them know that there's kind of like a balance to it that it's not every day is a bloat and stumble but there's stuff that you can do behind the scenes magic that you can work ways oh, to oh. work with the gods how do you kind of instill that i have all the let answers them know you. you know <laughs> no i have all the answers for you okay um First off on Seder, and again, when I first, you know, joined Vi Viking groups or went to Viking out outlets, there were very few women involved. And, you know, I am a Vala or a traveling priestess. I go all over the country and, uh, you know, I've done weddings all over the country and mm -hmm. even, you know, in other, in Europe and Canada. But um, with Seder, uh, again, uh, and also being a linguist, there's a lot of mistranslations. And one thing that's been done uh, all along is, you know, it said that Odin in, in the Havamal or one of the books, but you must understand that all of those books were transcribed by Christians who really didn't know what they were talking about or, you know, how to translate things. So a lot of things were lost in translation. And when it says it's unmanly to do save, that is a mistranslation. Okay. What it means is unman. And if you look that up in the dictionary, it's not that it's like feminine or unmanly. And anybody can do say, say there, but you could be unmanned, which meant possessed by, you know, a God form. And that mm -hmm. would unman you. It doesn't... Uh, you know, and you could, you know, some people faint after sitting on the high seat. Some people need mm -hmm. to be grounded because they've been literally, and this is uh, that unwomaned or unmanned. And it, it happens to priests. It's basically a take whenever you're well, sitting on the high seat, if there's a, a possibility a it, you can be taken out of yourself. Yes. Regardless of who you are, man or woman. You, you are taken out of yourself. You are un literally unhuman or unmanned or, you know, so there's your first <laughs> answer on that. And uh, I remember what the rest of that question was because I kept thinking of other things to tell you. Oh, the very, well, it wasn't the first time I met Diana because I used to hang with her at Marion Zimmer Bradley's house because she had a group going mm -hmm. and Diana was in it. And Diana's, uh, what, Di <laughs> this is complicated. Everything's complicated out here. But Paul Zimmer, who was totally into Odin and would have meetings in uh, the basement of Greyhaven on Wednesday nights at midnight, <laughs> um, he was Marion Zimmer Bradley's brother. So oh, wow. you know, we were all together in things. And many, many, one of Diana Paxson's first books, besides the, the oh, I'm trying to remember the name of all the ones, Dark, Dark Over, Dark something. Yeah, that's... Anyway, yeah, anyway, that, like I so said, that's a long time ago. But Diana Paxson wrote a book about uh, Brzezingamin. The, and, the, the, the... and in that book, that's the first one I, I, I was in, because she describes going to a ritual 
And it was the Winter Nights ritual. There's a variant of it on the video where mm -hmm. we do the I love Winter that Nights. ritual. Thank you. And Diana did too, because she wrote it up in the book. Because we used to do it in Tilden Park. And uh, that's very close to where she lives in, in Berkeley. Oh, very and cool. She came, well, she came more than once. But, you know, um, uh, that book was really cool because it has a paladin or a it was either Odin or Loki riding a motorcycle on the cover over the Golden Gate Bridge. And I will, I will, I will admit to you now um, that I am a thief. That ritual being shown on the video, I stole your symbol song to use in my symbols. I love oh, that song. I love yeah, that I song. That's that. one of the best parts of the ritual. I just Thank love that you. a lot. So it's like I thought I'd let you know that I am plagiarizing oh, well, I and using it in our rituals. Oh, thank you. Um, I had a, a group in Canada because our Oster ritual, we built a Viking ship and it's been anywhere from the size of a rowboat to, you know, you could hold it in your hands. Okay. And what we're, we're doing is we give winter a Viking funeral. Oh, at, that's so uh, cool. Yep, spring equinox. And we, we have songs for that. And we've been doing that since, since the mid 80s. And the first one was basically a log of wood with a mast and a red and white sail on it. And we set that off at Kirby Cove. And one year we let the ship and it actually took off. And it was a pretty big one. It was probably about four feet long. And it started rounding the corner at Rodeo Lagoon and heading towards the Golden Gate Bridge. And oh, we were following wow. the water watching that. We saw two fishing boats that were just, they had no idea what was going on. And, that was really fun. But uh, that's the same spot where, where the troth came out and uh, made me steerswoman. We could we used that spot for three or four years. It was an old bunker. Mm -hmm. We'd camp out in that and have, you know, the ship burning and everything else down there. And that was really a, a great spot. But then they said, oh, the paint in the buildings is all lead and they wouldn't let us use it anymore. But I'm glad you uh, like, like my songs. And I have more songs on YouTube under mm -hmm. Prudence I've Prince. seen them. Yeah, because this guy in Canada, that's not Diana and I were both at that. It was a, a upper Canada gathering and we were both there. But one night, because uh, everybody was always saying they were going to post me on YouTube and they're the only guys that ever did. And of course, I'd been drinking and having a lot of fun, but they're, they're <laughs> definitely real. So, and I'm working on a whole bunch of my songs. And I could sing you our Yule song if you want. Go for it. What is your Yule song? Well, let me take a drink. Um, this was from uh, a coven, Judy Harrow's and Margo Adler's coven in New York. And uh, it's from, geez, it's from ages and ages ago. Uh, but, you know, you hear a lot of witch versions of this, but this is a heathen version. So let me take a sip and clear my throat. And we were singing this Tuesday night, so I've already practiced. But and <laughs> everybody was singing along on the chorus, but it's uh, the gods all bless you, heathen folk. Let nothing you dismay. Just call on Thor and he will come and send his strength your way. And save us from the Christian curse that led us all astray. Oh, tidings of freedom and joy. Freedom and joy, oh, tidings of freedom and joy. Remember how we blessed the boar and gave the gods our song. Remember when we lit the wheel to speed the sun along. Remember when our minds were free and all our thoughts were strong. Oh, tidings of freedom and joy, freedom and joy. Oh, tidings of freedom and joy. They hid from us our father's eye and made him deaf and blind. The lady's necklace shattered as a nun she was confined. We no more sought the future, we no longer look behind. Oh, tidings of freedom and joy, freedom and joy. Oh, tidings of freedom and joy. The time is past when we need bow to words laid down by men. 
tear down the walls that block the way and once more seek the glen. The tree you turned into a cross is growing green again. Oh, tidings of freedom and joy, freedom and joy. Oh, tidings of freedom and joy. The gods all bless you, kindred folk, let nothing you dismay. For lo, the sun is born again upon the solstice day, delivering us from the dark and leading to the May. Oh, tidings of freedom and joy. Oh, I've got to... I love that. that so do so we. Cool. I love that. That is so cool. Um, and I like hearing seasonal songs. And again, with your kindred or whatever group you're meeting with, they don't even need to know the verses. So it was just great here when we had our Yule because everybody's going tidings of freedom and joy. You know, it just sounded great. <laughs> like it's a, a pagan choir. <laughs> that is so cool. Um, We've got a little bit of time left before we uh, wrap this up. I'm going to give you a few minutes. What do you have going on now uh, in, in oh. your life? Are you going, uh, you know, as far as your work with your Amber, uh, you know, your, your, you know, anything that's going on with your Huff? I think what are some of the things that are going on right now in the year 21 and coming into 22 for you? Okay. Well, supposedly, you know, I've had a really hard time. Uh, when COVID hit, I was in Minneapolis and Paganicon is spring equinox weekend. And of course it got canceled and I flew back on the 15th, the day before they shut California down. Mm -hmm. And uh, mostly we've been, and it's been hard even to celebrate in California because California has been pretty strict at, you know, enforcing mm -hmm. things that work against spreading COVID. But I'm supposed to, in, uh, for Halloween, I went to uh, a witch's ball in Cincinnati, and I, I was selling amber there, and I had three or four people come up to me and say, oh, weren't you Steers Women of the Truth? Are you Putin's priest? You know, I like had a half a dozen people come up. And the same thing happened. I was the, at the International Pagan Music Awards, which were held in Pittsburgh. Oh, like wow. I didn't even know there was an awards. And uh, yeah, and it's international. This group in Greece called Beltane won Best Band. And oh, wow. you can find the IPMA online. And uh, that's done by uh, uh, Melissa Anderson, who runs the cauldron.net mm -hmm. and Fringe TV, which are 24 hour a day uh, pagan heathen radio station and a TV station. So, and I'm on their board of directors. So I'm pretty busy with that a lot of the time. And uh, that's what I've done recently, but coming up uh, next month, they have a new iteration of Pantheacon at the Double Tree Hotel in San Jose. It's called Between the Veils because Glenn retired from doing all that because mm -hmm. she's 80. And anyway, uh, so I'm going to be attending and vending that and I'll have Amber for sale. And I also give out information on Romuva because once I got more and more into uh, the Viking stuff, if you look at a map of the world and you look at the Baltic Sea, that's, uh, and the Vikings were known to travel close to the shore. So all of the Viking, all of the Baltic Sea, I just call it the, uh, uh, the Baltic Circle. Again, yeah. <laughs> you know, because they, you know, it, it goes just, uh, if you look at a map, you'll see all the countries that are there. And, um, I first went to Lithuania in the 90s, and I'd been with, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Jonas Trincunas, who uh, worked at the university, and he's a philologist, and he, uh, or he was, uh, he died about 2013, I think, or 2014. Anyway, um, he was the high priest of Lithuania, and uh, they've been going, they were, weren't converted to Christianity till 1387. So that was kind of too late. It was a lot later than Iceland. So they still follow many of the traditions mm -hmm. of their ancestors because most people have never even heard of that country. And, you know, but it's very uh, rural and agrarian and all that. So mm -hmm. I go there every year. I made them a village. Our village is only, uh, it only has 12 properties in it. 
And uh, we own all but three of the properties in the village. <coughs> and so now they have pagan summer camp there. And we built the first pagan temple in Europe or the first new one, <coughs> excuse me, even before Iceland. And oh, the actually, one that they've talked about, yeah. Right, right. There's pictures of that to find. And so I'm still hoping to go to summer camp this year. And I'm supposed to be doing a wedding in Denmark in July or August. <coughs> Jeez, I hate to be coughing on the tape. Oh, that's but all right. I, I'm uh, doing as much things as, you know, we can go to and do. And I really hope I can make it to uh, Pagan Icon this year because I'm going to come in a week early and probably give some workshops. And That's cool. Uh, one one the, question uh, before you go on. I've always wondered over the years, have you ever thought of writing a book? I mean, I've been writing a book and it, I wrote it. I finished it 10 years ago, but I, 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 I've, I'm always asking people to edit it or look over it because, you know, I, I've edited. I've been an editor for 30 years, but I want somebody else to look at it. And I, I can't tell. I've sent it to a half a dozen people and they all promise they do stuff and nothing's oh. happening. Plus with COVID, I was just. Yeah, that's kind of hard, you know, to, to find that. people that are available to do it. Well, the reason why right. I say is because over the years, you know, within the heathen community and stuff, you know, in the United States, it's like it's been it's been you. It's been Diana. It's been these other people that have been out there. And, and you know, Diana has been on the forefront of it for so long. You know, not just her fantasy novels, but the stuff that she's wrote, you know, oh, with yeah. well, everything you know, she, since, you know. Yeah, well, you know, once you're a published author, you know, you can it gets get a little bit better, books. you know, like her and Ray Buckland and well, all these I other mean, people. That's, that's her profession is being a writer. That's not my profession. My profession is yeah. being a priestess. But anyway, that's very I cool. A lot of stuff up. And just like telling you the translation about Sather uh, or, or about, you know, Sather being unmanly. Because not like, well, just like you, a lot of people don't know that. Yeah. And that's, that's in my book, among other things. And a lot of people don't know about how to do out sitting. And a lot of people don't know about not all this stuff covered in my book. And oh, when you asked about the runes, the very best book on the runes, and Diana's done one, a lot of people have done books on runes, but even the ones that have written books on runes will tell you the best book is the middle book in the trilogy of Edward Thorson's books called Rune Lore, because that okay. covers Walder, that covers uh, runic yoga, that covers um, all the rune poems, and all the runes. And if you haven't read it, it's the best book on the subject. I'm sure you can get it on, you know, Amazon or even at bookstores. I've, I've seen it in bookstores. Also, since you're telling me this, another question, and it's like, and I know you probably got these in your, uh, you know, personal library, but for people that, because there's so much in, in pagan books, there's so much confusion because everybody's writing so many books about the same subject. And for new people, like, what would you recommend as for a good copy or source of the Eddas? And, um, uh, you know, some people, there are a couple of different worded versions of the Havamal. So what yes, do you think exactly. are some of the better ones? Because, you know, if you, if you want something, you, you want it to be as close to factual and, and not misleading as possible. So what do you think on those? Well, there are several thoughts on the subject. Um, James Chisholm did a wonderful translation of the Havamol. And uh, the book that the Rune Guild used to recommend on uh, the Eddas was Taylor and Auden. Okay. okay. That's the most common or easily accessible. But my favorite, which includes a lot of missing verses, was published by the Narina Society you know, at the turn of the 20th century. Oh, and okay. We have rune guilds. We, we were a, um, a, well, a group of the rune guild. Uh, we were called Croffin Guest, which, uh, well, we still are, which means blessed by ravens. Okay. And uh, I would have everybody bring a copy of the Eddas. And we would work our way through the Havamal and some of the other poems in there. And I would have everybody like, you know, there's like a hundred and something verses to the Havamal. 
Oh, yes. So I would have, we had like six to 10 people, depending, you know, once a month at the meetings. And I would have everybody read like verse 23 and go around. And that was a really good way to learn the room mm -hmm. because participation, learn, learn it by hearing it. Yeah. Learn it by hearing it and learn it by, you know, having somebody else read it. And I also have an article on that on the missing verses because my ones from before World War One have, um, and uh, one of the volumes, it's a 13, 15 volume set, depending on if they've got the indexes or not. But the what there's one that's just on the edits and it's fabulous. And the translations are excellent. And they were done by uh, Blackthorpe. I think that was his name. And, uh, um, you know, he was just writing down about, you know, his ancestors, you know, instead of saying, you know, uh, doing a Christian diatribe, he was just saying, oh, well, this is what our ancestors believed, <laughs> you know, well, or something. Like that. You know what, uh, you know what I'm going to do then? See, you're telling me this. What I would ask you to do it whenever you have the time is some of these things that you're telling me. Uh, uh, kind of message me there on Facebook and tell me where, point me in a direction where I might find them. Because once I get through with this video, uh, it's going to take a couple of days to go through and edit and then get it put up. And I will get a copy of the, of the when it gets to the YouTube. But I kind of want to put some of those in the, the show notes so that people can go and look for those things themselves. And I really hope that you do get your, you know, somebody to do your book because I think that would be, a, a, you know, as much as you've worked in the community over the year, I think a good book that has been put out by you would do so many people so much good because the one thing is like, we know, you know, not just being old guard, but we see so much of the new stuff that comes out and A, confuses people, B, doesn't necessarily always tell them the truth. It tells them what the writer thinks, but it doesn't necessarily make it you know, factual or, or as close to factual as possible. And I think one thing is you don't want to mislead people because then that sends them, sends them down a whole different path that, who, you know, who knows when you're kind of not giving people the basics of what they need to know, who knows what they're going to get into. So that's why I do these interviews is to get a hold of the people, the elders and stuff that have been doing this for as long as you and Diana oh, and Raymond you. and so long, because it's a foundation because once you know you can get these little bits of truth out to people, regardless of what Llewellyn or Red Will Wiser or whoever, whatever they put out, when you can get this to the people, that's why I'm glad that you get out and you do uh, rituals and workshops and stuff, because that's where the rubber meets the road. The priests and priestesses getting out there with the people to let them know that, hey, you may have all this in your library at home, but this is what we're going to do today. This is how you're exactly. going to learn today, you know? Um but uh, again, especially in Lithuania and even in my own practice, you know, uh, one of the reasons we did Ravenwood out in the woods was because it was before electricity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there, you, you, have, you couldn't even get on your cell phone unless you went to the parking lot. You know, <laughs> it, it's really remote. And that literally took you back to nature, which uh, almost, you know, all the pagan, heathen, whatever religions are based on, you know, uh, the ancestors and nature. Yes. And, and however you want to express it, that's one thing. And you can have a secret society or a secret coven, and uh, your coven knows all your secrets or your practices. And there's many books that have been published, but like you said, very many of them are just uh, misleading uh, and inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they've just, and I know authors that, there used to be an author and she would like, you know, how to practice Egyptian magic, how to practice Norse magic, how to practice. I <laughs> know who you're talking about. You don't even have to say who it is. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not gonna, oh, she's dead now, so I'm not going to mention her name. But uh, anyway, but uh, she did. And she just turned out books like that. But uh, and when I did, oh, I've got that sitting behind me. Oh, there's Odin. Um, when I was stairs woman. I'm the one that had these made. This is the R Truth book. And oh, I had wow. copies. This is leather bound, which is not showing up very well. Oh, there it did. That's it's got beautiful. A on it. And it was it's 700 pages. And Joel at Arbs Obscura did this. He's a fabulous bookbinder. 
And uh, uh, I had 24 leather bound ones made. And of course I sent one to Edward, but they were sold out immediately. And then there was a hardback and a paperback. But uh, this was a huge compilation. And again, there was a kindred up in uh, Seattle and they helped put this together. There were 350 sheets of, or 50 piles of paper laying on a, uh, Joel's floor. It looked like the Midgard serpent. And we went around oh, my gosh. To arm to put these all together. And then, you know, he bound them and they're sewn in signatures. And uh, where I'm at now, the guy here is like, this is the best book I own. And it is because it's like the best made and the best everything. And oh, this is his copy. Yeah. And he hand calligraphed uh, from his library. Oh, so, wow. The leather bounds had ribbons in them and uh i think we only charge 50 bucks but uh is yeah. that something that you would ever think of possibly uh redoing more copies of well the church would have to do that oh but, yeah because uh, it is it's yeah talking it's about doing it and i think they reprinted it in two editions you know because this is like i'll have to go to the website and see if i can find it because i've got the truth in my yeah but like there's a list of just this one page is all the writers in this book. Oh, okay. wow. That's a lot. I know. I know. And it's got me and Diana Paxson in here as elders, which we still are. You know, well, there's a lot of elders in here. But I've got this. This is I have Pat got number one of 24. And I gave this to him. It is in uh, October of 94. So that's how old they are. But these are, like I said, there were only 24 of these made. So Very uh, cool. Yeah, I'll have to see if they have anything compiled on, on the Trove site and maybe see about yeah. getting some of that. But Because you should just call me later. And, uh, you know, Pat has a library that's, well, nobody has a library like mine. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he has a pretty good library. And I say that because like Freya Oslin, Andy Biggers, all these, uh, you know, big names in heathenry that have been to my house and seen my library. They're all like, I hate you, Prudence. I've never seen a copy <laughs> of this. I have a signed copy, a signed first edition of um, the Grimm's book on Teutonic uh, mythology. Oh, wow. You know, yeah, the James Stollybreast translation. So, and, and uh, just endless. I, I have... Well, uh, my library is insured for two hundred thousand dollars. Oh that's wow, probably. that's a good thing, definitely. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not selling it. Oh, I, I don't blame you. I would not at all. Yeah. Um, so. But I just want to take this minute to we're just a little bit at a little bit past eight thirty, and I want to thank you so much for doing this with me, Prudence. It's just been, you know, it's like whenever I because I very first. Because I kind of, you know, I've been doing, I did another interview with a heathen author, Alaric Albertson. He's written some mm -hmm. books over the last few years. And I just recently did an interview with him. And I started thinking about people like I've interviewed Ray Buckland and Raven Gramassi and, and just a bunch of different people. And I said, okay, I'm just going to take the chance and see if, uh, if Prudence might be uh, technically, uh, you know, motivated to be on Facebook. And you were. And I saw yeah, that hey. you were there and I go. <laughs> Well, you know, I, you know, because I've wanted to interview, I used to have a show on Blog Talk Radio years ago. That's when I uh, interviewed Raymond. And I, I, I wanted to then, but I had so much stuff going on with my own coven, my own groups and stuff like that. It just exactly. kind of slipped out. But whenever I saw that you were on Facebook, I said, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and just send you a little message. I don't know if it's going to get through because I could tell by some of your postings that you had been doing some traveling. This was kind of like, even a little bit before COVID had started really to take oh, hold. Oh, yeah. And I'm not always online. You know, people, I get things like, I sent you an email three days ago when you had an Oh, answer. I understand that. Oh, I've I had things where I've waited months for people to get back a hold of me. But it was just so cool whenever that you did reply and I went, okay, this is cool. Because like I've had that experience of knowing about you, Diana Pax and these other elders in the community. And it's like, you know, doing this for people that are going to be seeing this, people that are you know, new to it, people that have been in it for a while, and just even other elders, it's like, these are the things that need to be done, because we're not going to have, 
you and others around for this much longer. There's going to be oh, a yeah, new yeah. group of people. And that's a good thing. But also, you know, it's like that wisdom and the things that we can learn and share and the stories that we can hear is what makes us pagan, which is what makes us family, you know, makes us right. the, the odd people that, you know, the whole world may not understand what we are, but we know who we are. And a lot of times that's all that matters. So sometime in the future, who knows, I'd love to have you back and do another interview, if at all possible. We'll see how that goes. And people that are out there, I suggest that, you know, if you're out and about and you do hear that Prudence is coming to your area, whether it's to a festival or PantheaCon or whatever, get out there and meet her because you're going to, for one, you're going to learn a lot. And I do, I have some information that may help you uh, get the DVD situation with um, Between the Worlds going a little bit better. Right. And uh, because that would be cool. I would love to have that on DVD because I don't have a, a VHS player anymore, but I do have a pretty darn good DVD player. And I would love to be able to watch that on a larger screen and see it, you know, especially that, you know, the Galder and some of the other things that are in the video. And, uh, you know, just look for her on YouTube because there's, I think there's like 12 or 13 different little videos of there with you singing and with various other people and stuff. And some of them are pretty funny. I love them. It's like, you just look like you were having such a good time and you stuff were. like that. And to the people that are watching this video also, I would ask that if you are uh, enjoying it, please subscribe to my channel. It's A Pagan Perspective on YouTube, capital A. And also to keep this thing going and, you know, to see about, you know, getting some more interviews and, and, you know, various things for the community. If you feel so inclined that you might go to Patreon forward slash Patreon, uh, Pagan Perspective and consider supporting the channel, supporting the work that we're doing with these interviews. We have interviews, we have meditations, we have rituals, we have all this kind of stuff. And it's like because of people like Prudence and the others that have gone before, even me, that are the reason why that people are starting to learn. This is the one thing, at least, you know, regardless of some of the little backlashes and things that we've seen over the last couple of years, people that are coming to heathen practice, however you're doing it, it's a good thing because you want to learn. You want to see where those northern lights come from, <laughs> how they affect you and what it is that makes it so an important part is just as much important path as druidry as anything else, because that's what makes us a human family, the work of prudence and other priests and priestesses around the world. And having said that, I thank you again, prudence. I thank everybody that's been here tonight. This has been so cool. There's been a great group of people here getting to hear, you know, your story and a little bit about your background. And to end the video, as I always do, I'm your host, Reverend Savannah Tree Walker, the Order of Standing Oak and Raven Temple of CX Wicca. And I will see you in the next interview, everybody. Have a good night. Uh, you too. Thank you. And may the gods direct you to the best. Thank you, guys.